If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. Today on the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, I'm talking with Rachel Hutchison. Rachel is a champion for social good. She is an impact leader with expertise in strategic communications, philanthropy, and ESG. That's environmental, social, and governance, which we're going to talk about today. Until very recently, she served as vice president of global social responsibility at Black Baud, leading the company's social impact investments, sustainability, and helping the company's 3,300 associates be agents of good, a position she just recently left. She is committed to the core philosophy that good is for everyone. And I just love that. She's a champion for positive change. She's inspiring, especially she really wants individuals to integrate service into their personal and professional development. She brings experience in marketing, brand communications, corporate culture, and strategic relationships to her role. She built BlackBod CSR or Corporate Social Responsibility Program from the ground up, leveraging her deep experience working at the intersection of business and nonprofit. She served as the chair of BlackBod Senior Women's Leadership Council, as well as a member of the ESG Steering Committee and the Diversity and Inclusion Council. She's a Riley Fellow, having attended Furman's Diversity Leadership Institute and participated in both phases of the Racial Equity Institute training hosted by the YWCA. She is past board chair of the Giving Institute and currently serves on the board of Common Impact. Now, she previously served on the boards of AFP Global, so you may recognize her name. Uh, you may have seen her on the big stage at AFP Icon at some point when you've attended that big conference. She has served on the board of the Coastal Community Foundation, the Black Bod Giving Fund, and Learning to Give. Her TEDx talk, The Era of Corporate Social Responsibility is Ending, is available on the TEDx YouTube channel, and we'll include links in the show notes so you can check that out. Rachel, welcome to the show. We'll start the show in just a moment after a word from our sponsor. Support for this show is brought to you by our friends at Bloomerang. Bloomerang offers donor management and online fundraising software that helps small to medium nonprofits, just like First Tee of Greater Akron, a nonprofit that empowers kids and teens through the game of golf. After just one year with Bloomerang, First Tee of Greater Akron doubled their unique donors, improved donor stewardship, and raised more funds. Keep listening to hear how they did it or visit bloomerang.com forward slash intentional to learn more. Again, that's bloomerang.com forward slash intentional. Hey, Tammy, thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here. Well, it's great to have you. I'll start by just saying congratulations on the completion of a very long and successful career with BlackBod. During those many years, how have you seen BlackBod evolve during your time with them? Oh, geez. So I have had a long and wonderful career at BlackBod, and I'm deeply proud of everything that the company has achieved and the part that I played in helping us serve so many wonderful social good organizations. I began at the company when there were only 100 people. We were being led by the founder. I've had the pleasure of working for all four of our CEOs. And during that time, just think about how much has changed over the last couple of decades. I started when there was dial-up email and no websites. And so the way we did work was a little bit different. In that time, the companies moved from providing DOS solutions to Windows solutions to cloud solutions. It's gone from privately held to public. It's There's been so much change. I kind of call myself a student of organizational change. And 
a lot of it was driven by the way technology became so integrated into individual people's lives through smart devices, cell phones, et cetera, and how that really changed how we interact, how we behave, how people raise money, all sorts of things. So, so it's been a real honor and pleasure to be a part of that journey and specifically to be there to chart the company's path in terms of how we not only gave back philanthropically, but as a socially responsible organization. Yeah. Well, truly, you've been at the heart of BlackBot's social impact during that time. When you look back on your time with BlackBot, what have been some of your proudest moments? What's on your highlight? That's such a hard question to answer because I feel like every week in my career at BlackBot, there's been a person who has done something incredible, either professionally in their role or personally in their communities. And I've just been surrounded by that and really gotten to interact with people based on what they're passionate about. And so I could name off lots of people who provided that kind of wonderful goodness. Um, but if you're talking about big occurrences, I would say that the first was really being given the opportunity after our founder retired. And I was working for a CEO named Mark Chardon and proposed the idea that I take on our philanthropy and really kind of updated and care for it because our founder had started so many wonderful traditions. And I felt like when Mark said yes, he was putting this really precious thing in my hands to carry forward to both honor the traditions that Tony Bacher had started, but also to evolve to fit who we were today. And that's really what I've been doing in my career, honoring our history and building on our very employee-centered um, practices, but scaling them, for example, to fit a remote first world. So that is kind of top of the list. The second thing I'd say is it's hard to beat the announcement of our first million dollar gift, which was made to the International African American Museum, which is being built in Charleston, South Carolina, where the company's headquartered. We made that gift right at the point where they were looking to close the gap to be able to actually raise the money to, this was in 2015, to build the building. It's going to open in the next couple of months. It's and then Mayor of Charleston, Mayor Joe Riley, really acknowledged Mike Giannone, our CEO, hand that gift for creating momentum at a pivotal time when the museum needed it. Very proud of that. And it was, it's not that it's just local to us, but it's this international museum and it was using resources to really connect everybody around the world to the incredible untold story of both what happened in South Carolina in way back when the slave ships were docking, but also all the incredible contributions African-Americans have made in society. So that's number two. And the third, I would say, is something I've been doing over the past five or six years, and that's our social responsibility reporting. And I told our CEO, I felt like we were jumping over our own story to tell our customer story. And we ourselves had to tell that story and own who we were as a socially responsible organization, which now includes ESG data. And that's been an important thing for all of our audiences, starting with our people, our employees, our customers, our communities, and our investors, not just our investors and not starting with them. So those are probably at the top three. Incredible. Like any single one of them would have been like really an accomplishment of a career when you think about the significance of them. And yet you have this, this huge culmination. Yeah. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people cool. involved in all of them. And Always. I love community and I love working in community and building communities and it's always an intersection of lots of different people and passions and ideas and skills that makes this work happen. You know, I'm a big fan of Jim Collins and he talks about level five leadership. And sometimes we think about leaders as these bright stars and very gregarious. And Collins is quick to say that it's often the level five leader that's shining the light on the team and the many and the collective and creating that community. And that's the culture that really moves teams and organizations forward. And I see that. I see that in our, what you're sharing. All the things, if you just think about the social responsibility reporting, that involves so many people and so much detail and people who are dedicated to getting everything right, whether it's the design or the language we use, the actual words or the data collection or all of it matters. And there are lots and lots of people who do that work behind the scenes and aren't the ones out front saying, hey, we launched this wonderful thing. But they're deeply important to all of it, definitely. I think leaders remove obstacles for people and help them do their work well, and then they recognize them and honor what they helped an organization achieve by bringing their skills to bear. 
Yeah, just beautiful. Well, let's talk about kind of the flip side of proudest moments. I'm wondering what some of your biggest regrets or disappointments might be. And it's not a like a shadow on Blackbot at all. It's like when you're up to something big, there are setbacks, mm. whether it's because of economy or culture or whatever. So what are the things that you've been disappointed by in the sector during this time or things that you wanted to get across the finish line that didn't quite get it or that m maybe morphed in ways that surprised you and maybe even delighted you? Do you have any regrets or if regret is too strong of a word, maybe disappointments? Yeah, I don't really look at my career that way specifically. I'm definitely a glasses half full person, optimist, and challenges, and more think about things that were challenges. Driving social impact is hard, and it takes time. It's funny. I, all sorts of people always say, oh, you, you have the best job, and it must be just so fun and easy. And I'm like, you really don't understand what I do if you just think it's, if you're looking at it from the outside and seeing all the celebrations and the announcements, but the work is actually hard. And it involves bringing a lot of people together and kind of walking down the middle together at a period of time. It's absolutely worth it. But but my only real frustration, maybe that's the right word, is that I think it took me too long to accomplish some of the things that I accomplished. It's And part of it is I was just learning. I was learning on my feet, being at a company that was small and then midsize. There's not a lot of guidance out there in the world. It's all for the big guys. I like to say like Starbucks, UPS, Toyota et cetera. There's lots of resources for organizations doing social responsibility at that level, but not the smaller ones. So we were figuring it out. And sometimes it took me, I think, too long to figure things out. And then, of course, in the middle of all this, I had two kids and all of the things that happen with families. But I wish I could have done things faster. But at the same time, you can't just put together a PowerPoint and say, this is my 5, 10, 15 year plan. And here's what we're going to achieve in social impact. There's so many other people and things going on within this ecosystem of a company and its communities that you have to make sure that people are all together and with you. So I think in order for it to be meaningful change and impact, sometimes you do have to recognize that it takes a while. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners can relate to that, right? They are working on big, hairy, audacious goals. They're trying to deliver on their mission. And there are always barriers that will arise when you really are up to something big. And mm -hmm. you do have to give yourself and others some grace. You have to sometimes pause or slow down or reevaluate, figure out the next best strategy. And things change. The conditions change. Yeah. People change. Sometimes you have a new leader who comes in and all of a sudden something that wasn't really possible is the first thing that's on their mind or technology changes or what's happening in the economy changes. So sometimes opportunities came at me when I wasn't expecting them. And other times I was really ready, but the economy wasn't great. Like you have to, that's just being a person in the world. Yeah. It really speaks to the agility. You know, I think about the 30 years you spent with Blackbaud, that just doesn't really happen anymore right? <laughs> to really stick with an organization, especially when you describe the evolution from 100 people to 3,300 people from privately held to publicly held. You know, how did you stick? Well, I actually think that's exactly why I stuck. The fact that it in the early days, I remember when we were on the Inc. 500 list, and we made that list twice of the fastest growing privately held companies. And our founder used to say the best thing about those announcements and honors was that we survived them. When you're hiring a staff that's doubling year over year, that's really hard. That's a lot of change. And so all that change almost becomes the work separate from the fact that you're, of course, supporting your customers and being engaged in the community and all of that. So I used to tell people that I felt like the company changed on a rate of about every 18 to 24 months. That it wasn't that it was different, completely different. At the heart, we were the same, but we were bigger. We were doing more things. We were bringing out more products. And that's challenging. Now, I tend to like change. I like pace. I've grown up in tech, so I'm not at all scared of that. But 
what it meant is that there was always opportunity coming and things changing. And sometimes you would just all of a sudden find yourself involved in something. I found myself involved in a series of about 12 acquisitions, which was incredible, interesting work that I very much focused on the culture and strategic communications around that and the relationships with customers. And it was such a fascinating thing. And that was right at the moment when many companies couldn't afford to shift um, from DOS to Windows. They didn't have the financial investment to be able to do it. And it taught me so much about how all of those companies worked and what didn't. So it's con the fact that the company was changing and continues to change means opportunity. It means you're learning something new. Your brain is engaged. You're challenging yourself. Things are different. And that's exciting to me, not sitting in the same role forever and having it be the same thing. Yeah. I think there are lessons in that for our listeners, whether they are an executive director or the chief development officer, or maybe a major gift officer, or they're managing some component within the philanthropy or advancement area to things change. And so to remain curious and to be agile and to look at those changes as exciting and an opportunity to learn and grow. And I think that there's a real beauty in not being indispensable, right? So I think sometimes we hold on out of fears, we hold on to what we knew and the role we played, but by kind of opening that up and working in that community that you talk about and that you so love, being in community and helping others grow their skill set on your team doesn't mean, oh, I'm no longer the only one that can do that. It means we are as, as a community, as a team are stronger, and the evolution creates new opportunities for all of us to grow and develop. Hearing you talk about the different roles that you took on, and that's how you grew to VP of this really big company. Yeah, I think change is just a part of life. And one of the things I, it bugs me is when something big happens and everyone says, well, there will be no change. We're not going to change anymore. It's like everything's going to change all the time. And in my career, I've seen that change from DOS to Windows to the cloud. Online giving was not a thing when I was first introduced to fundraising. Online giving is very complex. Most people think it's just magic. You press the button and it all happens. But what it takes behind the scenes to do that, the complexity and the sophistication that's yeah. been brought to the nonprofit sector by tech vendors, the whole expansion of then social media around that, the idea that you can now have people who carry your brand in their hands, whether you know that, that or not, who have individual brands. And that was just not even something we talked about. The whole terminology has changed. You think about the capacity for online giving, social reach, storytelling, all of those things have just exploded and created wonderful opportunity for organizations. And I love that word organizations because it's not just companies or nonprofits or government, it's organizations to do new and different things. Not saying that other old traditional things aren't important too. AFs have been around forever and gosh, they're more important than ever these days as donors seek control, privacy, different ways to give. So, so Rachel, what have been some of your biggest ahas or insights or maybe trends that you've seen as you reflect on your years in the sector? I was just talking about online giving, and that really was fundamentally huge shift. The idea that you could actually have, and if you think about what that's predicated on, it's predicated on the fact that organizations actually had an online presence. And if you're a lot younger than I am, you would think, well, of course they do. Many organizations struggled. And when GuideStar came about, it was, oh, great, we have this organization that put our 990 out there because we don't necessarily know how to even do that. Organizations did not have websites, let alone websites that were interactive and beautiful. It's all of this photography and storytelling and video. The first websites were very static. And so having an external image that takes you beyond the geography of your mailing reach, your direct mail reach, is kind of a huge thing. And then being able to engage people, not just in ways where social media, I think, is so wonderful is it helps drive people, online marketing, digital marketing, but also social media, driving people to who you are. And those people are not necessarily just the people who used your services or graduated from your school or live in your community. It gives you this bigger presence. 
and provides you the ability to have this visual storytelling and connection, motive connection, which we all know is important in fundraising with so many people. And at the heart of that, there's the plumbing of online giving and technology, but there's so much more too in social listening and understanding your donors and prospects and the technology, which can be a challenge for a lot of people, also breaks down these barriers and allows organizations that are not huge to do really wonderful things. So I think that's one of the biggest changes that I would, a lot of fundraising has not changed because I don't think it needed to. It's a real science and a real art and the practices are are known and beloved because they work and they're real. I've seen the stages where people said, oh no, we'll just not do that. That's just new things. And you really having this integrated way for how you meet people where they are Mm -hmm. and open up in your minds who those people might be who might support you has been wonderful. Well, the other change that I know nonprofits don't love is that there are social impact organizations that are not nonprofit that are out there driving change. And I'm okay with this because I think we need everybody at the table. But the competitive landscape's a little different because of the same things that I think are a gift to nonprofits. There are others out there trying to solve problems too, which I think business has always done, frankly, but just in a new way. Yeah. I think the problems that we're working to solve are too big for any one sector, any one organization, obviously. I am also a believer that it will take all of us. And I think it's maybe the scarcity that's been so ingrained in the nonprofit sector that has us not embrace or not be hesitant to collaborate with others. I'm definitely an abundance mindset person. And I'll tell you that what you're hitting on there is where the phrase good is for everyone comes from. It means two things to me. And I talk about this in my TEDx talk and another talk I did later on about ESG. And first is that good is also for companies. It's not just for nonprofits. I love nonprofits, but good is for everyone. It's for every person. It's every company, every organization, every community. And that's important because we need everybody at the table. It's not like we just say, I tell everyone I graduated from college in the Gordon Gecko Greed is Good era, which you would remember if you saw the movie Wall Street. And if you want to make money, you went work work in business. If you wanted to do good, you went to work for a city government or a nonprofit. And you also gave up the idea that maybe you would make any money in your entire life. And now it's like there are all of these paths for how you can do good in the world and drive positive change. And I think that's fantastic because the problems are huge. The second meaning is that good is not just for big companies. It's for every kind of concern. 72% of all people who work in America work for small to mid-sized business. Of course, good should be them too. So it's this idea that it's such a basic statement. It's almost like, well, no kidding, it is. But well, let's own that. And I think the current generation helps us do that. Yes, I think that is true. I think that we're seeing this younger generation really want to be hands-on and they're so attached to causes, maybe even more so than organizations, right? But these causes... And it's become a real key strategy for employers who want to hire these young, bright, very skilled young professionals and to attract them by their commitment to social good, right? That is a selling point of a lot of companies, whether they be the big ones or the little ones. So good. Rachel, you talk about some of the trends you've seen from a technology perspective and that there are some organizations who really gravitate to that. They love the change. They know the technology can really help them accelerate the mission. And there are a lot of organizations that hold back. Like, you know what? We've been doing okay the way we've done it. We're gonna, or gosh, I'm sure that technology could help, but it would be take an investment or they probably won't say investment. They would say it will be expensive, right? So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's an important distinction, whether you look at technology and even philanthropy infrastructure as a cost center or an investment center. Mm-hmm. But I digress. As we look to the future, we have crypto philanthropy. We have artificial intelligence. We have a lot of emerging opportunity that does involve technology. What advice would you give to organizations who have been on the fence or hesitant to take that step, that next step toward technology and new ways of fundraising? 
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. First T of Greater Accra needed to switch from an outdated donor management system to something more user-friendly. With Bloomerang, they found that and more. Here's Executive Director Josh Smith sharing what he likes about Bloomerang. We love Bloomerang because it's so, like, it's very user-friendly. We're able to do more because our daily tasks of thanking donors and sending thank you notes have been cut more than half because of Bloomerang. Year over year, we have raised more funds, so obviously I think Bloomerang's been a, a huge part of that. By investing in a donor management system that they actually love using, First T of Greater Akron was able to raise more funds and continue creating lasting change in their community. To listen to the full interview with First T of Greater Akron, visit bloomerang.com forward slash intentional or click the link in the show notes. I think probably the most simple thing is just to think about our own lives. I'm sitting here talking to you on an iPad. I have my phone. Like, it's really hard to exist today without a smartphone. Do you think about all the things that require you to enter a code to access the website? If you lose your keys or like all the things that that fundamentally focus around you having a device in your pocket, they're really engineered that way. And so if you look at my 87-year-old father has a an iPhone because we realized he needs one. Like there are certain things that he really does need to have that rely on that, that are dependent on that. He doesn't need all the features of it, but there's some that are critical. So I think if people just think about their own lives and not the fact that they're a board member in a boardroom of a nonprofit or they're working for a nonprofit and there's a scarcity, potentially scarcity mindset or a potential lack of resources, Infrastructure is incredibly important. Think about the infrastructure of your own life. Are you wearing an Apple Watch or do you have a phone? Do you have a car that has any technology in it? Of course you do. Technology is everywhere. And that doesn't mean you have to use all of it, but to deny it means you're saying that this organization needs to function outside of how society is functioning. And that's just not realistic. And what it does is it completely cuts you off from the opportunities that technology brings. Now, Technology is that you don't have to use everything that it offers. You have to be careful with it. You have to protect your data. You can decide whether your data gets shared or not. You should be savvy about it. But it is important. It is a reality. It's not just some fad. So I think thinking about yourself and your own reliance on it helps you be more comfortable and also then opens you up to the possibilities of, oh, wow, think about what we could do yeah. if we had these tools. Good. But that's the thing. Like if I say what's frustrating about the sector over my career, it's been that there hasn't been more change. People have committed their lives to building nonprofit infrastructure and trying to limit turnover. And we still have the salaries that need to be higher and all of these things that this, the nonprofit sector is so vitally important and we need to invest in it. How do we get that message across? Especially when we look at the other sectors and people who invest in the nonprofit sector through their contributions, whether they be corporations or foundations or governmental organizations or individuals. How do we get the message across that what overhead investments in infrastructure, investments in technology have a return? And to not make those investments I feel the work. If I knew that answer, I'd be saying, look at this great thing that I accomplished over my career. Because I think some organizations get it. A lot of it's dependent on their boards and they do amazing things with technology and fundraising and they raise way more money to go to their missions than others. And some don't. And so I think, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the Generosity Commission and that's something that I've been involved with and came out of the Giving Institute and the Giving USA Foundation as a group of commissioners that have been tapped for a period of a number of years. We raised money. We've struck new research to understand what do we not know about giving and volunteering in America, adding it to what we do know to really understand the state of generosity today, because giving and volunteering was going down if you look at the number of people doing it. And that's scary because it obviously you make the jump to that means nonprofits have less the nonprofits are incredibly important infrastructure in this country. And so the Generosity Commission actually seeks to help uncover and tell the story of what generosity actually looks like today in America and make recommendations about what can we do to help enhance it and grow it. 
And so that's an effort that's trying to look across the whole sector. Well, not even sector, that's not the right word, the whole issue. But nonprofits themselves really do have to tell their own stories about what they're doing and what they're accomplishing. And they should not be afraid to talk about why technology is important. A lot of the donors and people they're talking to today live with technology. Like it's incredibly embedded in their lives. And so I think there's over the last number of years, there's definitely been a shift. You should have fewer donors who say to you, like, I don't understand why technology is important. It's a powerful point. We need to tell our own story more powerfully and more frequently. Yeah, so good. Rachel, you're an advocate for ESG. Explain to our listeners what that is and why it matters and how it's different from CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Sure. So first I'll say that I don't even love the term CSR anymore because I think it focuses too much on the C, the corporate, and which is really the, the title of my TEDx talk was the Arab Corporate Social Responsibility is Dying and Why That's a Good Thing. And of course, you're supposed to be provocative. It's not dying. It's changing. And what I was arguing is that the focus on the C, the corporate, was wrongheaded. That makes it seem like the companies are these monoliths. And really, it's about your people and it's about community. And so I tend to call the practice social responsibility. That, to me, is the highest level thing at any organization, not just a company. And that is about all of the ways an organization makes decisions and operates through the lens of social responsibility, how it treats its people, how it treats the climate, who it partners with, how it builds and offers products and services, all of those things, not just the things that people typically think are in the CSR bucket, the giving, the volunteering, the culture, which are wonderful, important things and very strategic, but can be sometimes pushed aside or seen as like down the street and around the corner from the business. And Social responsibility is really about all of those things, all, everything you do, decisions you make, people, et cetera, talent. So ESG is, stands for environment, social, and governance, three different terms. And it's incredibly misunderstood and it's a clunky term. I believe that ESG is a subset. It is its own thing, which really came out of financial risk and investors. Investors looking at what is the risk of investing in this business? what environmental risks they have, social risks or governance risks. And can you report on these things which tell us how you're mitigating that risk? What's material to you? Doing a materiality assessment of what's material to your different audiences. And then what are you doing? For example, if you sell products in plastic bottles, what are you doing about the environmental impact of that? If you use water for a product, what are you doing about clean water for the world? So connecting your role in in the world with issues in society and potential risks to the business. So it came out of the investor world, but in the context of social responsibility, I see it as a piece underneath your overall social responsibility umbrella as a way, particularly for public companies, because that's who this is focused on, although I think it should be for everyone. It's a way to identify what's material to your organization and then report to the world on it and be very transparent. What are you doing about the climate? For a tech company, it's people, it's data. It's the climate, it's where your building sits, it's how much you fly, it's all of those things. And so it's a way that companies are evaluated and rated and scored. And it's happening to you if you're a public company, whether you know it or not. But I think it's actually a part of something that's much broader because it, it, the term gets misused. It gets used to represent so much more than it actually is. And I think the way a company gets around that is they think about, well, who are we? What is material? What matters to us? What are we going to do about it? And how are we going to work for it transparently? So it's a piece of the overall practice of being committed, setting goals, being transparent, and communicating to your community. And some of those communities are very technical ratings agencies, investor-related communities, for sure. But they're also like the people who come and want to work for you. Like they want to know, not in the technical terms, but they want to know, are you good to the environment? How are your human rights practices? And they want to know all of that. So there's a real marriage and there's a lot of misunderstanding in the Mm -hmm. term the use of the term. So if there's an organization, let's just say some of our listeners are part of organizations that want to take a step forward, being environmentally aware and responsible, who want to look at all of these pieces, what do you recommend as next steps? Is there a think tank? Is there a governing body? 
that's one of the things that's confusing about it is there are lots of different ratings agencies and groups that are taking bites out of this and they all have their different view of exactly which pieces are the most important. E stands for the environment. S is social, where you get human capital, community, supply chain. And G is all about your governance. It's about your board and your policies and all of those things. Like, do you really have a human rights policy versus just saying you have a practice? Well, you need to have a policy and then you need to measure yourself against that policy. It helps you enhance your practice. So I said this in a talk that I did in last year um, called ESG is for Everyone. That first, just educate yourself about what ESG is. Just go Google it and see what is under the E, the S, and the G. And whether you're a public company or not, just think about your organization. Does your organization understand what's important under those things for you? And like for governance, some of it is appropriate term limits for board members. That's important. That applies to any nonprofit. So just think about what, quote unquote, is material, what is most important to your organization. And then what are you doing about it? And own telling the story and sharing data about those things. It doesn't have to be in a specific format because frankly, there are a lot of different ones you can adopt right now. It's just about you saying, we understand that we're an organization that exists in the world and we have these responsibilities and these potential risks. And this is what we do. This is how we're handling it. This is how we treat our people. This is how we mitigate an issue with how our product is offered or Etc. Yeah. And I think nonprofits do a lot of this already, but they're not thinking about it through these lenses. Yeah. And I think it's important to just at least think about it, at least so you understand how companies are thinking. Yeah, because yeah. they're very much wired to think about ESG today. It's in the news all the time. But it's because that's partially because it's become very politicized and misused. Yes. Um, it's often misused when you hear ESG. People are talking about not liking stakeholder capitalism or not liking that a CEO said something. It's That's not technically what ESG is. Yeah. So even at a grassroots level, as a organization, and most of our listeners are with nonprofit organizations, it could be as simple as let's look at our environmental impact. Like, do we mm -hmm. recycle? Absolutely. Blackwood did this thing many years ago where our city had a green business challenge. And we were, got involved in it. And it was just, it literally, it was a spreadsheet. And you went through and we were already, we were one of the earliest recycling companies that recycled in the community. But it asked us about things like, do you have low flow faucets? Do they turn off when someone's not washing their hands? Do the lights shut off in the bathroom when you leave? Like all sorts of things, some of which are really easy to do. And it helped us understand what we were already doing and what we could do. Now, there are certain things we couldn't accomplish until we moved into a new building. And when we build a new building, we had a wonderful leader on our team who led the development of what is now the gold certified building and adopted all of these practices in the building and creation of our new home that allowed us to take a real leap because there are moments where you can take a leap. But if you think about it, there are lots of things that you can do. You just become more and more aware. And it's always a journey. No one's ever perfect. Yeah. But it's That's important. Good. It is. And just one quick little tidbit. I know when I served as chief philanthropy officer of the Children's Center in Detroit, and uh, I was there for nine years, I've been gone for a little over two to work full time in my business. And our gala, like the big 1,800 to 1,000 person gala, it was important to one of our top supporters who cared about children and families, the mission of the Children's Center, but also had some was multi-passionate. They cared about the environment. And so it was important to them that we offset our carbon footprint, even from our well, sure. are really small things you can do that really, if collectively we're all doing them or a good portion of us are doing them, they really do add up and they help us tell a more responsible, conscientious story. Yeah, DEI is a huge part of this too. I just said human capital, but DEI and DEI practices is a huge part of that. And you mentioned a gala. Is someone looking at who you're purchasing the flowers from or who's doing the catering or who's providing the event draping or all the contracting work that you bring in to make a gala happen, the music, et cetera? Are you looking in your home community? Are you looking at minority and women-led businesses to purchase from? Those things really matter. A question we've often gotten asked is, are you spending within a certain mile radius of where your headquarters is? And that 
are you buying local? And some things it's no, but other things it's actually not that hard to do that. It's just, it's more of a, that's why I call it a social responsibility lens. It's like, are you making these decisions thinking about these factors? Yeah, so important. And then even when we talk about human capital and DEI and the legs, the stretch into governance, like do we have a diverse board? And Mm -hmm. are we not just filling the board with diverse people with different lived experiences and backgrounds, of course, race and age and gender and all of those Mm -hmm. things, but are we actually then giving them voice? Not just checking a box, but hearing what they have to say, pausing to really more deeply understand their point of view to strengthen our board and our organization. And I did a wonderful interview. It's if anyone's interested in going back through to a past episode with Crystal Cherry, the board pro Mm -hmm. out of Atlanta. She's just an incredible leader and expert in DEI and a woman of color. And so like her presence, her credibility, her the way she speaks into this is Mm -hmm. super powerful. And there are a lot of great consultants and experts in this space as well. Goodness, time is flying by, Rachel. I have to ask this question. You've been so entrenched in the sector. You've been of service through your work of with Blackbaud, of such service to the nonprofit sector for so long. I can't imagine that you're really done. Like this is in your DNA. <laughs> I am not done. <laughs> so no, what? and people say like happy retirement. I'm not retiring. I just I've done a lot. I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I'm so proud of what the company's accomplished. I'm just ready to move on to what's next for me. Now that does not mean I'm leaving the social impact space because I'm not. I want to go drive more impact on an even bigger scale. I want to take everything that I've learned and done and bring it to bear for whatever is next. And I don't know what that is yet because I didn't want to look for that while I was still ordering and representing this incredible brand and company that I've worked for. Or I didn't think that was right. I wanted to honor that and bring a very positive, wonderful, meaningful end to it, which I did. And at the same time, it's like I'm just switching my category from active to alum. You don't spend this much time in an organization and then say, that's behind me. It's a part of who I am. I watched people in organizations learn how to raise money by using the razor's edge. Like I watched that solution evolve and help organizations do many amazing things. I'm so proud of that. I'll still be proud of that. So I'm very interested in the intersection of corporate and nonprofits, of the power of bringing corporates to the table and having them see things more through a social responsibility lens, which as they do, provides more opportunity for nonprofits and different kinds of partnerships. So watch my LinkedIn. You'll see at some point, I'll say, this is what I'm doing next. But I feel like I'll just be doing it differently and somewhere else. Just, I'm definitely not retiring. Yeah. Yeah. And you're way too young for that anyway. (laughs) Well, we will definitely keep an eye on you and we will include a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes so people can actually follow you. We're all anxious to see what is next. So Rachel, at the end of each episode, I like to ask a few rapid fire questions to provide just a little extra value for our listeners. And it's worth noting, you are not a fundraiser, but you have worked as a corporate philanthropist, a board member and a volunteer. So the lenses you see our work through, this work, the collaboration through all the sectors is just so insightful. Are you ready for the first question? I am ready. What's the best fundraising advice you've ever heard or given? People give to people. Yeah, amen. What book do you recommend to our audience and why? The Six New Rules of Business by Judy Samuelson. She leads the Business and Society Initiative at the Aspen Institute, and it maps out the six old rules, the really kind of the rules that were in place, capital is king, people are cost, all that when I went into business. And the six new rules, which are all about culture and people and purpose. And I think it really quickly shows people the shift that's happened in business. Yeah, so good. What are the three most important traits a successful fundraising professional must possess? I think you've really got to like people. It shows if you don't. You have to understand why details matter a lot. They are really important in relationships. And I think you have to be able to ask. A lot of fundraising is PR, marketing, lead up. But if you can't ask for money, then you shouldn't be a fundraiser. Yes. 
What's your favorite fundraising tool or application? Feel free to be. Well, that would be, so currently I would call that RENXT, but as I said, the Razor's Edge, I've seen that go from a DOS version to what it is today and people learning about fundraising and how to raise money through using that tool and the incredible richness that it offers today with all of the data insights in it. It really is an incredible tool and I'm so proud to have been a part of an organization that brought it to life. Yeah, yeah. Rachel, what's your favorite conference? In the fundraising world, it's got to be Icon from AFP. I talk about that when I've been on stage. I talk about it almost like a family reunion because it is just such a wonderful group of people, of friends you've met and friends you haven't met yet. And in the social impact world, I would say the Social Innovation Summit, which is something that a wonderful man named Steve Klein runs that really begin, brings together organizations and causes, not just nonprofits. A lot of corporates are there, and I think it's a great community. Yeah, very good. And last question, knowing what you know now about fundraising and philanthropy, what advice would you give someone just getting started in the profession? Relationships are everything. I think I give this advice to everybody in any situation because they are. Get your LinkedIn page, meet people, connect with them. Just know people and don't do it because you think you want something from them. It's just because things will happen if you connect and engage with other people and see them as people throughout your career. Yeah, so good. Short story. I don't know if you remember this, Rachel, but the first time I met you, I spoke at the North Carolina statewide conference on fundraising. And after night one, there was this, these amazing women that came together, Gail Perry, Ellie Jordfeld, Colette yeah. Murray, and you, and I was invited and just like pinching myself that I was invited to the table to have dinner with these amazing women. And you sat to my right. And I listened to you and we talked and you told stories. And I thought, this is one remarkable woman. Oh, thank you. And, and, that, and you just mentioned a whole bunch of people who I'm really honored to have been mentioned in the same company. So thank you. Amazing. Amazing. So to your point, here we are, like literally 15 years later, having a conversation. So relationships matter and connections matter. Yeah. yeah. So good. Well, Rachel, thank you for joining us. It has been such a delight. Well, thank you so much, Tammy, for having me. I'm a committed donor, board member, volunteer. I really tell people that I live a life of service. I just do that typically from a corporate perspective. And I'm on this mission for other people to understand that is an important and possible thing and that we all should be at the table to, to help each other solve these big problems. Yeah, because good is for everyone. Good is for everyone. <laughs> if you want to learn more about the incredible Rachel Hutchison, the Generosity Commission, or Blackbaud, we've included links in today's show notes. You'll also find links to the other resources that we've talked about today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. Keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now for a final word from our sponsor. Thank you to our friends at Bloomerang for supporting this episode. If you'd like to learn more about how Bloomerang can help your nonprofit acquire, retain, and engage donors, or learn how First Tea of Greater Akron doubled their unique donors, improved donor stewardship, and raised more funds in the first year with Bloomerang, head over to bloomerang.com forward slash intentional or click the link in the show notes. The Intentional Fundraiser Podcast is a Fundraising Transformed original. It's hosted by me, Tammy Zonker, founder and president of Fundraising Transformed, where we help equip and empower fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, and board members to transform their fundraising so they can transform the world. Visit fundraisingtransformed.com slash podcast to subscribe to this podcast and subscribe to my newsletter to get fundraising lessons, tools, and helpful resources delivered straight to your inbox each month. 
If you want my help with taking your fundraising to the next level, become a member of my Fundraising Transformers community as a growth member and join me live each month where I'll teach you the same strategies I use to lead, train, and coach thousands of nonprofits, social service organizations, healthcare foundations, private schools, colleges, and universities to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars including a single gift of 27.1 million. As a member, you can participate in my Ask Me Anything sessions every month and get answers to your burning questions. Chat with other growth members inside our private and safe online community about what you're working on, struggling with, and share lessons learned. And get instant access to my growing library of on-demand self-paced training classes. New content is added every single month. Learn more about becoming a member at fundraisingtransform.com slash growth. Talk soon.